I'm so glad everybody's joining us today. This is the second in our series. Um, we have our program is called Limnot Yamenu Kain Hoda, Graceful Aging. And this program takes into account specific mental health issues and concerns related to today's seniors and those of us who aren't yet seniors, everybody here, but love seniors, okay? <laughs> It gives a variety of helpful ways for us to frame what's going on in life at in this time. And the series was made possible in, in part by a grant from our own Pacific Southwest region. And Joseph P. Reardon um, and the Joseph P. Reardon Foundation. And there's no charge for any of these programs. So like for today... As questions come up, you can put them in the chat and we can look at them. Um, it will be easier to do that than to message either rabbi because they're going to be concentrating on the program and that way we can all see the chat. And um, please keep yourself on mute unless you're answering a question so we don't get all the noise. And Rabbi Sachs, would you like to introduce our presenter, please? Yeah, thank you, Fran. And for those that don't know, Fran is the uh, chair of our lifelong learning at uh, Amayam. And I'm delighted today to uh, be welcoming um, uh, a friend, colleague, and teacher, uh, Rabbi Richard Address, um, who is the founder and the director of the Jewish Sacred Aging Project, which you can, which is housed at uh, JewishSacredAging.com, written all as one word, Jewish Sacred Aging. Um, so you're welcome to check that out on your own afterwards. It is filled, uh, replete with all kinds of wonderful uh, items for you to access um, so that all of us can be uh, continuing to age gracefully. Rabbi Adra served for over three decades on the staff of the Union for Reform Judaism first as a regional director and then beginning in 1997 as the founder and the director of the Union of Reform Judaism's Department of Jewish Family Concerns and served as a specialist and consultant for the North American Reform Movement in the areas of family-related programming. Rabbi Address was ordained from Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in 1972 and began his rabbinic career, as we just heard, um, in Los Angeles congregations, including at Beth Elohim, Adat Elohim in Thousand Oaks. He also served as a part-time rabbi in Carmel, New Jersey, while he was regional director, and after his tenure with the Union of Reform Judaism, served as senior rabbi of Congregation Makor Shalom in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. A major part of Rabbi Address's work has been in the development and implementation of the Project on Sacred Aging. This project has been responsible for creating awareness and resources for congregations on the implications of the longevity revolution with growing emphasis on the aging of the baby boom generation. This aging revolution has begun to impact all aspects of Jewish communal and congregational life. Rabbi Address has received a certificate in pastoral counseling from the Postgraduate Center for Mental Health in 1998 and received his Doctor of Ministry from HUCJIR in 1999. He also received an honorary doctorate from HUCJIR in 1997. In January of 2007, he was awarded the Sherut La'am Award from the Kalsman Institute for Judaism and Health. He regularly teaches Jewish family uh, classes on Jewish family issues and sacred aging at Hebrew Union College's New York City campus. In March 2010, he was awarded a Best Practices in Older Adult Programs and first placed by the National Counseling, uh, Council on Aging Interfaith Coalition on Aging. He regularly contributes articles for websites on issues related to spirituality and religion. He co-chairs the Committee on Spirituality and Diversity for CTAC, the Coalition to Transform Advanced Care. For four years, he hosted a weekly radio show in Philadelphia uh, called Boomer Generation Radio, 
And beginning in winter 2018, Rabbi Adras began hosting a weekly podcast, Seekers of Meaning, dedicated to discussing issues related to aging, spirituality, and the impact on families and congregations. He has um, authored numerous articles, books, uh, chapters uh, uh, related to aging. One of the chapters was something that he and I sort of worked on together. It was for a book called Psalms and the Key of Healing, um, which was really a work uh, uh, for uh, our colleague, uh, Rabbi uh, Raphael Goldstein of Blessed Memory, um, who was also a, um, a chaplain. Uh, and, uh, and Rabbi Adras uh, contributed uh, a chapter on Psalm 71, Confronting Mortality, um, a beautiful chapter uh, in that volume. Um, um, so with all of that background, it, you can now understand why um, it is a tremendous honor for me uh, to welcome to you and present to you Rabbi Richard Address. Hi, thanks, Rabbi Sachs. Nice to see all of you. Hope all is good in my old hometown. And um, just stay safe and stay healthy. We have lots of work to do tonight. And here's what I like to do so you know where we're going. Um, part of everything that we do in Jewish sacred aging, all the workshops we do, the classes we teach in synagogues and seminaries uh, are all text-based, based upon the, the primacy of Jewish text. So what I'm going to try and do with you today is give you a couple of texts to form what I call my theology of relationships, because in everything we've done, and everything we've done in Jewish sacred aging, and even when we did this stuff for the reform movement, the one thing that has come absolutely crystal clear is as we get older, the most important thing that we have are the relationships that we have with other human beings. And, and, and we don't have the time to go through all the books, the literature, the scientific studies, the, uh, the longevity studies from Harvard and X, Y, and Z that really validate this but all of you know this in your own neshama so jewish sacred aging as rabbi Sachs alluded to is the largest program of its kind that really just tries to focus on what the hell's going on as we get a little older um and and really basically the third and fourth stages of life that from from the from the, the zoom machine it looks like we're in and this is extremely important because if you take a look at the 2020 Pew study of the American Jewish community, if you look at the demographic analysis of that, one of the things that leaps, leaps out at you, should like grabs you, is the fact that 49%, 49% of the people who identified in this survey as Jews, and it was about six and a half million uh, who identify as Jews in the United States of America right now, 49% of the, our community are over the age of 50. And this was, a de this was a statistic five years ago. So you could probably extrapolate that out that easily you can say with absolute clarity from the Pew study that close to 50% of the entire American Jewish community are over the age of 50. Interestingly enough, the majority of the Jewish community institutionally, uh, federation-wise, synagogue-wise are on blinders. It's just like they don't want to deal with it. Um, but we do. And the podcast, the Seekers of Meaning podcast, which posts on our website every Friday, and I put in the chat how to get a hold of me and how and the and the website is Rabbi Sachs talked about, really wants to take a look at what's the spiritual challenges? Uh, what, what what's happening not outside, but inside our own families, inside our own inside our own Nishama. And this particular theology, I'm going to try out with you tonight based upon two or three, if we have the time, text. And if you have questions, pop them into the chat. We're going to try to do this so we can get all your questions. My email is in the chat. So if something comes up and you want to contact me afterwards, feel free to email me. And by the way, if you'd like to write for the website, feel free. The invitations is yours. Here's the first text. This is a, 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 a magnificent text. 
It comes in Genesis 2.18, chapter 2, verse 18. It's the second creation story. You know, we got two creation stories because we're Jewish. We have to have, we have two Talmuds. We have two creation stories. It's, they do this purposely to drive rabbinic students crazy. <laughs> the second creation story, which is the earliest, um, the, the scene is Adam. They create Adam. God creates Adam. He's all alone, running around the, uh, the garden, doesn't know what to do. And he says, look, I, I basically says, I'm tr I'm translating this into the New Jersey translation where I live. And you know, he basically says to God, look, I'm all alone here. I got nothing to do. There's no baseball yet. So wh what am I going to do? God then turns around Genesis 2.18 and says, it is not good for you to be livado. This is a high holiday word. High holiday word in the sense that it is a, it is a high holiday sermon. Livado in the translation, if you look at the translation, means alone. But it really is not alone as in the sense of I've had 17 meetings today. I just want to go home. I want to take the phone off the hook. I just want to make myself a sandwich, get the clicker. I don't want to be bothered. I just want to be alone. Leave me alone. I don't need any more Michigas. That's not the alone that it's really talking about. He's talking about the existential aloneness. So when Fran was talking about aspects of mental health, this has become even more predominant post-pandemic. Um, and if you've read the op-ed articles by the Surgeon General or his book together, which is a very, very good book and a high holiday book, by the way, uh, on the epidemic of loneliness. And there's constant, constant, constant articles uh, 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 about this um, in just, just scanning stuff. This is from the other day's Washington Post uh from february 16th which is a couple of days ago the loneliness cure about making one friend a year we've posted a bunch of these articles on our jewish sacred aging facebook page but the epidemic of loneliness which is a whole subject of itself uh and and a challenge for the united states of america but this is the existential aloneness uh, for those of you who are dabbling in mental health, or maybe you, some of you have been mental health professionals, this magnificent book, also a holiday book, uh, called Staring at the Sun by the philosopher, by the therapist Erin Yalom, Y-A-L-O-M. He talks about um, this existential aloneness. This is the livado. This is the existential aloneness, ladies and gentlemen, that you could go to Dodger Stadium, God forbid, and sit in the middle of 60,000 people and feel totally and alterably alone. It's the Hebrew word karet, karet, cut off. And this is a mental health issue, but it's an existential issue. We have many people who feel cut off, who are literally livado. By the way, this word comes up again in the reunion uh, chapter with Jacob and Esau, where he goes to the river Jabbok, sends everybody away. He's by himself. And in 30, Genesis 32, the word is the same word. Jacob stands at the river Jabbok and he is livado before he wrestles with the angel or whoever he wrestles with. So this idea of alone drives us as Heschel, if you've read your Heschel, who reminds us that we are creatures in search of meaning and we are creatures who need to be needed. We need to be in relationship with other people. And as we get older, this becomes absolutely essential. Look, when we're 30, 25, 35, our circle, our circles of relationships and acquaintances are probably pretty good. But once you start getting to your 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, those circle of relationships get smaller and smaller. And so the intensity, the need, because when you lose one of those relationships and you're 32, it's powerful. When you lose one of those relationships when you're 82, it's very different. So this need to be needed, this idea of, it is not good that we should be alone. No one, especially anybody who joins a synagogue, no one in this day and age should ever, ever be allowed to be alone. And 
we don't have the time to go into all the synagogue programs that we've worked with to, 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 to deal with that. But this epidemic, and by this way, of epidemic of, of loneliness and isolation also is exhibited through some mental health issues. So the Judaism approach to mental health, this is one of the other workshops we do on health and wellness, where we trace not only the Jewish text approach to health, physical health, but also the voluminous amount of texts within the Talmudic tradition and even in the Tanakh about Judaism and mental health. And it's there. Uh, one of the magnificent things about studying text is that you'll be amazed at the breadth and depth of, of the text, our Jewish textual tradition, that speak to what we're living with every day. So the first text then is Genesis 2.18. It is not good that we should be livado. Second text. In, uh, I will humbly suggest to you, the greatest chapter in the Torah, of which there are many. One of them's coming up this week. But Genesis 3, Genesis 3 is perhaps one of, if not the most powerful chapters in the entire Jewish liturgical uh, uh, literary tradition. For those of you who forgot about it, because it doesn't come up until the fall, this is the mythology of Adam and Eve. This is the mythology of the Garden of Eden. And it is God's first question to the human race. Ayeka, where are you? Not I'm in Florida or you're in Ventura or wherever. But where are you spiritually, emotionally, theologically? Where are you? And this opens up a door so some very, very, very powerful conversations, which I urge you to continue well after this program, because the questions are difficult. The questions are challenging. And I will submit to you that every single one of us on this call asks these questions. Because you see, ladies and gentlemen, Genesis 3 is the, biblicals, the biblical author's attempt to deal with our own finity, our own death. You think about it. If you read that chapter, you understand it, the tree of good and evil, the tree of life. This is the situation where the biblical author understands that despite all of our desires, all of us, every single one of us, are mortal. And we will die. This is the fundamental existential question. And it's raised right away in the Torah in Genesis chapter 3. This reality of our own mortality. It's a fascinating, fascinating chapter. And we don't spend enough time on it. We sometimes, you know, we 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 focus on the little bubble mice and made up stories about the garden and whatever or whatever, what kind of it was, what kind of a fruit it was. Who cares? But the real truth of this chapter is what keeps us up at night sometimes. This is the type of chapter that when we unpack it, we can also trace some of our own life with it. For example, I'm going to submit to you, feel free to disagree, that as we get older and as we live our life in this journey that we're all on together, many people come to the realization and the reality in their own life that I don't need any more stuff. I got enough stuff. I don't need any more. What I do need as I get older, is an understanding of why I'm here. Because I'm realizing as I get older that there's going to come a time when I will not be. And this introduces, I will suggest to you, the three questions of existence that germinate and evolve from Genesis chapter 3. These are, I'm going to suggest, feel free to disagree, 
These are the only questions that matter. This is it. Here they are. One, why was I born? Two, why must I die? Three, why am I here? Why am I here? We are here, to paraphrase a Chaim Potok book, The Chosen, a great book, a mediocre movie. We are here for what amounts to, in the span of the universe, a blink of an eye. Why? Are each one of us some accident, cosmic accident of sperm and egg? Or do each one of us have a reason to be here at this time in the history of the universe? And if so, Ayeka, what, 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 what is it? What is it? And so when Heschel and others write about the search for meaning and purpose, or Viktor Frankl's magnificent book, Man's Search for Meaning, and when Viktor Frankl writes in that book that when we ask, what's the meaning of life? That's the wrong question. But rather the question to ask is, how can I live my life? So it has meaning. Genesis 3 is that chapter because it asks those questions. Why was I born? Why must I die? Why am I here? And I'm going to suggest to you that the importance of this chapter is it really is the basis for all religion. By that, I mean the following. A healthy soul wishes to live. There comes a point in our life when we understand that we will not live forever. When those two realities converge, the result I'm going to suggest to you is what we call religion. We make up stories. We create afterlives. We create gods. Why? Because we do not want to be alone. <clears throat> Levado. That we do not wish to die. And that is why we need people. That is why we, re we, we, we reach out to be in relationship. And that is why, as we get older and see so many of these relationships disappear, these why questions become more and more important. And those relationships that we have become more precious and more dear to us. This is why this chapter I would suggest to you is so important because at the end, each one of us wants to be with other people. We do not want to be livado alone because lurking in the back of our neshama, especially as we get older, is what is basically the ultimate aloneness. And that is the end of our own existence. So Judaism, understanding this, what, what is what is the, the way our tradition speaks to us in this way? It says, grab hold of life. Because you don't know. There's a midrash somewhere. Rabbi Sachs will correct me if I'm wrong, because I think I cut that class. Um, that you, 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 you repent one day before you die. And so the rabbi says, oh, no, how do you know the day you're going to die? Ha -ha, you don't. So every day you live. You live, it's as if you're this. Grab hold of life. Don't be afraid to live life. Some of you may know people who get to be a certain age, and, and by the way, age is not relevant on this, because some of you may know people in their 20s and 30s who stop living. They exist. Ex exist. And one of the tensions that we live with in life is the difference between existing and living. Judaism says you live. You grab hold of life. You go forth into a future you do not know. That's okay. 
no matter how old you are, do not be afraid to take that risk, to live, to try it, to learn. Because until the last breath that you take, you're able to do mitzvot. And even in death, kavod hamet, you're able to be a vehicle for mitzvot. So this idea of living life, of holding on to, of embracing life, is so precious in us. And how best do we live our lives in relationship with other people? In relationship with other people that we share, that we experience. Look, one of the one of the great challenges right now, the American Jewish community, in fact, the American community, is this phenomenon of what is called in the literature called solo agers, S-O-L-O. -O. People who have no family, no children, never been married. They're now getting older. And they don't know who's going to take care of them. They don't have a, a spouse or a child to whom they can assign on their durable power of attorney or their health care proxy. They're alone. And we have somebody who writes for our website a lot, uh, uh, Carol. And there's an entire national movement around this stuff. In fact, we last year we did a podcast, one of the people who just wrote a book on solo aging. But this is a phenomenon that is growing in our country, growing. And it's the livado factor. That's why this word from Genesis 2.18 is so powerful. So you have Genesis 2.18, livado. You have Genesis 3 and the why questions and God's first questions of Ayeka. The material versus the spiritual. The reality of our own mortality. Which leads us to to this other phenomenon, this other text, Deuteronomy 29 and 30. Deuteronomy 29 and 30. It's, it's Parasha Nitzavim, which comes up in August or early September when most of the people, at least in, in, the, in, in our area, in Jersey, they're down the shore. So it's that important that we do it again on the Yom Kippur. Because you know you this is you, you you shouldn't miss this portion. This is a magnificent portion as a coda to these three these other two uh, 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 verses, other two chapters. Why? First of all, the beginning of of Nitzavim twenty nine Deuteronomy twenty nine has a repetition of the word Hayom. The word Hayom in Hebrew means the day. Oh, new? So the rabbis say new? Why does Deuteronomy repeat the word Hayom so many times? Couldn't they get it straight? And one of the answers, this is a great commentary. Any of you meditate, by the way? Any of you meditate? Raise your hands. One, one meditator, two meditators. Do I have three meditators? Three. Do I have four? Do I have four meditators? No. Okay. May auction off the meditation. The, the, the rabbis say, look, Hayom, the day. This is the day that you can control. You focus on the now. You focus on today. Today is Wednesday. I can deal with Wednesday. I can't control what was, okay? I can't I can't I can't control what what what, what happened last week, last year, 3 years ago. I God, I look at those choices I made when I was 22, 24, 26. Everything, everything. Oh, I wish I could go back and read that. You can't. You can't control tomorrow. You have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. None. Right now, what happens right now, you can exercise some control over. Listen. Those of you know the Torah, what's the first letter in Torah? It's a bet. The bet is closed at the top, closed at the bottom, it's closed in the back. It's open to the future. You can't go back. There's a one of the books, one of the authors we did a podcast with a couple of, I think maybe a year ago, has this wonderful image. This is a sermon image, by the way. That when you get in your car, next time you get in your car, look, which mirror which which window is bigger the the rear view mirror or the windshield why says these authors you can't go back you can only go forward or in the circle game if you remember that song from the good old days uh we can only look back 
from where we've come in the circle in the in, in the circle game. I blew that lyric. But what it means is it's the bet. We go forward today, today, Hayom. And then you have this magnificent text at the end. Some of you know Deuteronomy 3019. Look it up if you don't believe me. 3019 is Uvacharta Chaim. The beginning of that says, yes, you're going to be in your life. You're going to have good, bad, blessing, curse. So we suggest Uvacharta Chaim, choose life. But the B part of the verse is the most important. We never teach you that. The B part of the verse is, why do you choose life? So that the people who come after us will be blessed. In other words, no one makes decisions alone. But the things that we do in life affect other people. This is really important. And this is why this verse, along with 218 and 3, form this little triad of basically underscoring this idea of a theology of relationships. Because ultimately, we all make choices. And the Jewish moral ethical position is we urge you to make choices that sanctify life. Sometimes these choices are very easy. Sometimes these choices are horribly difficult. Sometimes these choices are between good and bad. And sometimes these choices in life are between bad and badder. But we all make choices. And even sometimes, and every clergy person has had this experience, even sometimes saying, I got to wait and see what happens is a choice. And there's actually a Talmudic expression that it undermine, uh, underscores that choice. So, this idea of choice is part of our sacred tradition. And as we get older, the choices that we make are more powerful because of that B part of it, because we understand that the choices we make will influence the people who come after us. Because you see, as try as we might, there are things that we cannot control in life. We can exercise control over a lot of stuff. What's the, and this is part of the high holiday liturgy, right? What, what's the major, the major prayer in the high holiday liturgy is the Unitana Tokef, which is this magnificent prayer that really the theme of which is, what do we control in life? Who shall live? Who shall die? Who by stoning? Who by drowning? Who by this? Who by that? It's frightening. When you're a kid, it really says, oh, I hate this. But as you get older, you understand the metaphorical implication, the symbolism of the language. And you understand that what that prayer is telling us is we don't control much of importance at all. And the, and, and the one thing we cannot control, and this stems right from Deuteronomy, from, from Genesis 3 and Genesis 2.18. The one thing that we, you could sit in synagogue 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You could pray your guts out. You could never eat a lobster tail, a cheeseburger or whatever. And it won't make a damn bit of difference. Because the one thing that we cannot control is time. This is a whole high holiday sermon. You're not getting it now. Don't worry. But you think about it. Time. Time. And especially as we get a little older. And especially as we get a little older, the time becomes more precious. It becomes more precious. Our, our, the time we have with other people becomes more precious. The time we have with our spouse, our children, or if you're so blessed, your grandchildren. I remember the first time this hit me. Maybe this, some of you, if, if you're grandparents, I don't know how many of you are grandchildren. I have grandchildren. But the first time this hit me, well, 10 years ago, and the prince and princess, otherwise known as the two greatest grandchildren in southern New Jersey, we were wrestling, you know, stuff like that and we 
I called a timeout and I looked into these two kids' eyes and I realized that no matter how hard I prayed, no matter how many mitzvahs I did, I cannot go where they're going to go. And I want to go with them so badly. But I can. This is Genesis 3, writ large. And so what happens to many people who have this reality and it comes in a variety of different ways is that we understand that the choices that we make are going to impact those people who we leave behind. And by the way, we pray for it in many ways every single time you go to shul. First paragraph of the Amidah, Avot, the Imahot, if you have the matriarchs in your liturgy. What is that prayer about? If you look at the prayer and unpack it, it's about legacy. It's the mothers and fathers of our tradition. And it's our own legacy. What are we leaving behind? Deuteronomy 30, 19, fantastic chapter. The idea of choice, the idea of legacy. I'm getting an echo. Oh, I can do the starting lineup like at the ballpark. Okay, somebody turned it off. Okay. It was another iPhone that came on. I think the iPhone was... The, the the whatever the electron I'm, believe me i have no idea what i'm talking about um but you know what i am you know what i mean so this so these three these three verses genesis 2 18 levado introduces the whole idea of of isolation not being alone and the power of being in relation genesis 3 the why questions of existence the understanding of our own mortality Deuteronomy 30 and 29, Parasha Nitzavim, the idea of today and seizing and living for the day. And then this idea of legacy and time. Because I, I would suggest to you that, that these form a, a, a magnificent, a magnificent little introduction to theology of, of, of really our own sacred relationships and ourself. And the power of this and the need, the need to be with somebody. Look, I'll give you a perfect example, then, then we'll open it up to the chat. You're going to study this uh, Shabbat uh, Parasha Kitisa. I just put this on the website because on the website, we do a, a weekly Torah commentary just for older adults. It's just specifically focused on our generation. Um, there's a lot of psychological commentary about this particular portion around the golden calf because Moses is away. He disappears. He goes away and the people get anxious because they're, they, they, they used, they, they need to be, to see something. They need to have something tangible to hold on to. It's like when a parent goes away and that two-year-old can't conceive of time. And there's a whole series, those of you as mental health professionals, the, the attachment theory, this is all, you, this is the beauty of Torah study. You can apply lots, so many great things to Torah study, but there's actually an attachment theory interpretation. Uh, Vivian Skolnick wrote a book about it um, on this particular portion. But at the, at the bottom line of this in many ways is the children of Israel want to be in relationship with Moses left. They, they need to be with somebody. They need to see something. And so they, they, they turn to idolatry. How many people do you know, and we're in a society where this is rampant, who in the need to be in relationship to other people will make bad choices? And the, when we did the Department of Jewish Family Concerns, we had a whole project called Refuat Nefesh which dealt with self-destructive behaviors of children, cutting, suicide ideology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, eating disorders. You know what? Some of this stuff kept coming up over and over and over again in the hundreds of teenagers that we interviewed all across North America for this project. 
kids kept saying, when I was in high school, when I was in junior high school, I wasn't part of the cool crowd. I wasn't part of the in crowd. I looked funny. I talked funny. I didn't fit in. Nobody really wanted to be with me. So there was a group who sort of like welcomed me. And that's where I went. Looking back now, it was the wrong thing to do. But that's where I went. We need to be in relationship. And we need to be loved. And we need to love. Not necessarily romantic love. But this is another Heschel thing. We'll go where we receive validation. We'll go where we will receive affirmation and love. That's why the synagogue, by the way, that's why the synagogue is so vital. Because it is a community that accepts, holds, embraces, and loves. And for which no one should ever feel levado. Okay. Chat time. What do we got? Um, uh, who's going to monitor this? Because I'm Rabbi, you're muted. There you go, uh, Rabbi. Hi, Sorry. Rabbi um, Address. Thank you so much. What uh, I'm sort of astounded trying to take in all the uh, wisdom you offered and all the vital things for us to be thinking about and framing. We have a uh, comment in the uh, uh, a question in the chat. When you talked about being alone, does that mean feeling alone like I have no one? Or is it alone I don't have God? Or is it alone I don't have either of those two? Uh, I, I would say, is this Joel? Wherever Joel. Joel's walking in the forest. Um, Joel, my, my gut reaction, it's all of the above. Um, I, I, it's all of the above. One of the things we struggle with in Judaism. Um, the strengths I struggle with. No, say again. I didn't hear you. I, I said the strengths I struggle with. No, I was. Go ahead. I think we're talking at cross purposes. What? Oh, you, you, Dale, you disappeared. Where? Where'd you go? You fell into the the ocean, the the grass there. Whoops. Now you're muted. All right, let, let, let me try let me try to answer. I think Joel okay. it's it, it's a combination of both. When okay. a rabbi when a rabbi stands up on the bema and says you are never alone because God is with you. First of all, very few rabbis say that. Um I would say that it, 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 it raises all kinds of, especially in contemporary synagogue life. Of the people of the people on this call, let me ask you, how many of you feel that God is with you all the time, that you're never, never, never alone? Two? Two out of 11, 10? And, and, and Fran is kaka kaka. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. That's a good Jewish answer, by the way. Um See, part, part of our theology is, is because we have, this comes right out of the Torah portion, by the way, because we have, our God concept of unity, but we're constantly evaluating and evolving that. Look, don't believe me. You're under no obligation to believe anything I say. Go to the text. Go to the text. Exodus 3, the burning bush story. When Moses asks the, you know, the bush, bush says, Let go to Pharaoh, say, God says, let my people go. He says, if you think I'm going to Pharaoh and tell him that a voice from a burning bush said, let my people go, you're crazy. Give me a name. Give me a name. Shirley, Ralph, Ramona, just give me a name. And the translation, which is un the Hebrew, which is untranslated in a lot of the modern translations is, ahia, asher, ahia. what does that mean? I'd suggest that it means that you are given this freedom in Judaism. Think about this. Think about this. That you are challenged to continually evolve your definition of what God means. We do a horrible job of it. Kids walk off the bima 
at 13 with a 13 year old concept of God, which is usually the, you know, the image of the supernatural being, you know, 20 years later when they, if it takes that long and they have to deal with real life and they reach into their pockets. And when they pull out a, what they hope is a, a theology that will support them. And it's basic for some, for a 13 year old and they throw it away. It, and we don't talk about this enough in synagogue land. We do not have these conversations about what do you believe in? What is your theology? So this idea of being livado with God, I would challenge the synagogue. I challenge you to have some serious conversations about well, what does it mean? What does it mean to you? Are you are you ever alone? Is God always mm -hmm. with you? And 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 what does that God mean? What what if God is with you? What kind of God is it? You know, it's like it's like every rabbi's had this. It's the it, it usually happens at one of the most horrible inventions of the human race, the cocktail party. Horrible invention. So we're standing there with our club soda and lime, making pretend we're drinking something because God forbid the members of the congregation think I was having a drink. And you know, somebody walks up. This also happens at the Oneg Shabbat thing as you're on your way to the M&Ms. And they say, you know, Rabbi, I don't believe in God. Like, like we're supposed to, like, the earth's supposed to open up and we're supposed to go screaming out of the room. To which we also say, well, that's fine. What what God don't you believe in? The Torah God? The, the, the sheik, the tribal sheik God? The God of the academy? The humanist God? The God of the naturalists? Which God don't you believe in? But by the way, that ends the conversation pretty quickly. Um, but you got to have this conversation because it's part of being Jewish. Um, Andrea, my former teacher. So many people feel live ado due to chronic illnesses or lack of solid parenting. Judaism uses words like your BET. I don't know what that is. Um, how do solar ages make the most of this stage of life? Um, like your bit. Like my what? The letter bet. Oh, the bet. Oh, the bet. I thought that was a mnemonic for something. I, um, Andrea, you ask one of the great questions. And, and the reason why I mentioned the solo ages, because there's a whole group of Jewish solar ages are basically saying, what the heck does that have to do with me? I go to all these meetings. All I hear about are everybody's families and their children and their grandchildren. I don't have any of that. Where, where, where am I on this? So, as again, uh, Carol writes for this, and there's a, an entire subculture, she told me, and it's online um, uh, on solo ages so all over the world, Jewish, uh, that are connecting through the, if you go to the great God Google and you put in either elder orphans or solo agers, you probably will be connected to this network who are struggling with this. And the society is just now, even the Jewish society, just beginning, because this is a growth area in our in our community, just beginning to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. We just can't make assumptions that people have all these support networks. I just did a, a program with a panel at a congregation in Tampa two weeks ago on end of life stuff and bioethics. And they were talking about the documents that you had to have in state of this is in Florida, blah, 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 blah. And then some, and then we, we mentioned, you know, but there are people in this room who don't have spouses, children to nominate to be on their durable power of attorney for health care or their health care proxy or their advanced threat. What do they do? And I've had solo agents say, look, address, it sounds great. But if I nominate my friends, we're all in the same boat. We're all getting we're all getting the care. So if we're all in the same boat. We need, how do we handle this? So this is a conversation I would urge you to have uh, within the congregation. Uh, and and there are ways, there are, you know, other people in the congregation, caring community, clergy uh, that can be helpful. Uh, elder care attorneys, uh, of which there are many, and we always advise people to go through elder care attorneys. But this solar age stuff is really, really important. And it's growing. And, 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 and it's growing. Um, um, other questions? Yeah, I have a couple of questions, Rabbi Address. Um, it's Rabbi Sachs speaking. Yeah, I know. I, okay. Hi. Um, so, uh, 
One is that you picked out the significance of Genesis um, uh, 2 with Adam and Eve. And God's directing them about not being alone. How old do you imagine Adam and Eve to be? And why is it significant that God chose to tell them at that point in their life? I have no idea. You know, first of all, I don't believe it ever happened. So, I, you know, I think it's a myth. It's a myth uh, based upon a bunch of the early parts of Genesis and pre-Hebraic documents. I mean, the Gilgamesh epic and all this other Hammurabi and all this other stuff. And I don't really care how old they are. Well, um, my thinking is, is that the directive is given to people, hopefully at a point that they're able to take in the question uh -huh, and actually that... respond to the question. And of course, it's literature. It's not a fact, but the literature imagines characters who I'm assuming that Adam and Eve were not one year old. I'm assuming right. that they weren't 105 years old. I'm assuming that they must have been some age that God felt and that the author of the piece felt were people of an age and the people he was writing for were at an age that this was a message that they needed to hear and could take in. Absolutely. Yeah, so, absolutely. So, and, uh, yes. So when you say a person is not meant to be alone and you say that to a teenager who's 15, I don't think the question really has much meaning to them because uh, I, most teenagers don't feel like they're really alone. Um, uh, other uh, than if they have a real problem, then they tend to isolate. But I'm not sure if self-isolation is always the same as feeling alone. Well, Steve. What's your thoughts? Uh, I, I would disagree with some of that. Um, Good. You know, that's why I wanted, I just alluded to the the um, the portion for the week. Because you can make, I think, Rabbi, the, the idea that the Israelites, as they created the golden calf, were alone. Um, missing dad, Moses. And there's been enough studies of infants with attachment theory that because uh, uh, that one-year-old may not have a concept of time, you know, or that two-year-old or three-year-old, when mom says, mommy and dad are going out, we'll be back soon. You're going to stay with, you know, surely. They, that concept of time, this is why I'm fascinated by the concept of time, fascinated by it. Mm -hmm. um, that sense of aloneness, almost abandonment, is I, I think is interpreted in different ways at different ages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some of my work with teenagers, even though they're very active in some cases, you know, this, that, and the other thing, but in their psyche, despite the fact that they're there, here, and here, they feel very much alone. And I think a friend alluded to in the introduction some of the mental health concerns, the mental health concerns of teenagers right now are so overwhelming for a whole variety of reasons. It's another adult education class. Um, but a lot of them are outwardly active and inwardly live a do. You have people in your, con mm -hmm. every con we have people in every congregation, every congregation. Yes who are outwardly active and inwardly live a dose. Some of those people have the courage to walk into your office and say, I need to talk to you because even though I'm here, I'm very active in business, I'm this, I have a wonderful, I feel totally isolated and alone. Um, Thank and you. This is, this is a real, and it's a real existential that's why I love the word levado because it's not age specific, but it opens the door to a tremendous amount of existential issues. We're almost out at 757 here on the East Coast. Yeah, I, I had two other questions. Um, 
One was, is there a particular, and, and if you can answer briefly, then we get to the third question, is, <laughs> is there a particular figure, character in our tradition, whether it's Tanakh or, or elsewhere, that is presented as a literary model of someone gracefully aging? You know, that's a great question. I'm thinking about a professor of mine from my, in my doctoral program, Carol Ox, um, whose book, and I forget, just the title ran right out of my head. Um, but she did a lot of work with uh, 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 Joseph and Jacob as mm -hmm. paradigms who start out like, you know, crazy, manipulated, and then emerge mm -hmm. and become whole. And become uh -huh. almost heroic in 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 that sense. So they, they would be very, very good role models to look at because they really span because, you know, kids who who grow up to be really mature contributors who started out as, you know, crazy 14, 15 and 16 year olds. You may have that a throw out of Hebrew school and then 40 years later, they're real mensch. So think about Joseph and Jacob. And their paradigms of their life cycle. It's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, beautiful. I will think I'll ruminate on both of those. Finally, um, you had said that sometimes the choices we make, um, like whether to keep kosher or not, what difference does it make? And I'd like to um, to have you clarify via a story of our colleague, Rabbi Raphael Goldstein Zal who used to tell the story often of all the star uh, starfish that were- Oh, the starfish um, episode, right. Right, who were, uh, were on a beach. They somehow got washed up on a beach and somebody saw this and started to throw them back in the water. And somebody came by and said, you know, you can't save them all. What difference does it make? And he said, well, it makes a difference to this one. And so I'm thinking, that sometimes the choices we make may not necessarily make a difference in a certain sense, but maybe they do make a difference in another way, in the fact that it will increase the meaning in our lives to know that we stay connected to traditions that we've tried to maintain throughout our lives, that it, that it matters to us to not lose our sort of dignity around our Jewish choices or other choices in life and that we continue to not just say nothing I do really matters. Maybe Hello. the things that we do will matter to grandchildren or to each other or to our synagogue family um, or to God or whatever. So I, I would like a clarification okay. on, on, on that if you don't mind. No, 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 no. Because I think uh, um, the I think I froze too because I'm the condo I'm in has really wonky internet so i think i may have frozen for like 30 seconds you but did. i got the i got the gist of your question um so it, it, you'll excuse my little the choices we make are very very important it is not to say anything about kashu because it matters very very the choices that people make about how they identify and relate to that stuff in our tradition is extremely important extremely important the context i was trying to point out is a that there are some choices that every choice you make is a, is important and it does impact other people and that some choices are between good and bad and some choices are between bad and badder bad and and badder for example and i'm really thinking about those choices that we have to make towards in in bi and medical ethics and bioethics situations about sometimes when the arsenal of medical technology is exhausted and the doctor says, you're going to have to make a choice. Do we increase, do we continue to be aggressive or do we go for comfort care? Both of those choices may not be great. Okay. Both of those, but there's this value system in Judaism. This is not the lecture for that. There's a value system in Judaism can instruct us, even though they hurt the, 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 the Kashru probably was a bad example, but the power of choice is so overwhelming in our tradition um, and the choices that we do make. And I do believe this is why I, I always like uh, 3019 because the choices we make do impact those people who come after us. Remember the good old days when I was younger in the sixties, you know, everybody says it doesn't make it or matter what I do. It's my life. 
Well, Judaism says, no, you're wrong. What you do, what you choose does make a difference because it's not only you, it's infected, it's your family, it's those who come after you, it's the memory, it's the memory that you live. All of these are combined to make up the power of Deuteronomy 3019. So uh, if I misspoke, I apologize, but it was a lo in this context of, 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 of really the types of choices, and we don't have the time to go into that. There's a whole theory of choice that I have, but we don't have the time to do that some other time, maybe. Yeah, well, uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, really, Yasher Kala, um, Kala Kavod Laka, and really, I'm going to, to sit on um, everything we've heard, and I'm going to look at those texts uh, two or three or 17 more times to take in <laughs> your wisdom today, uh, Rabbi. I'm really, really appreciative, and uh, thank you. And we have, uh, I'm going to turn it back to Fran, um, so, because I think she's going to announce our very, uh, specifically, our very next session in this series. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank My you, pleasure. Rabbi Thank you. Anderson, really, a lot of food for thought for people and those people that are doing the Musa class. Oh, yeah. Um, lots to add to think about with what we've been talking about. It's very, very powerful. So I just wanted to let people remind people that this Shabbat, um, Saturday morning, Rabbi Jennifer Flam, the chaplain serving at Community Memorial Hospital, will be teaching during services spiritual aspects of aging. Um, and it will be live. And Joel, yes, it will be live via it will be live stream also. And we do have, you can still make reservations by letting me know. There's still room for the Kiddush luncheon. And then our next um, series will be with Rabbi Dale Friedman on Wednesday, March 13th on Zoom at 4 p.m. And, and Rabbi Friedman will be helping us explore the legacy that we want to um, leave for others. And for any other information, you can look at our website, congregationamhayam.com. And also... These these sessions are being recorded, and the first one from Rabbi Geller is already up, thanks to Mark Rich, who did some magic for me to get it Hello. done. And so I really hope that you'll take advantage of that. Um, and I and and there's as Rabbi put in the chat, there's no cost for the luncheon. And I think that's it. Did I forget anything, Rabbi? Sachs? Uh, no, we didn't. Uh, you did not. Thank you so much. I appreciate Rabbi Sachs, excuse me. Uh, the hospital's calling. I got to jump off. Take care. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Call up a vote. Yes, your call. Take care. Done. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, thank you all for being here ahead. today. Uh, God willing, we'll see you on Shabbat uh, for well, our eight, session eight. with Rabbi Flam, and we'll see you for our other sessions as well. Uh, take care. Lehitra out. Shabbat Shalom. Bye-bye.